Davis. And I'm Namita Sugandi from Hartwick College. And welcome to another edition of Chai Stories. Hey, when does milk become important in the story of chai anyway? Well, in the subcontinent, we have archaeological evidence dating back to early domestication of not just one, but two different cattle types, the zebu cattle and the riverine water buffalo. The zebu is notable for its hump, drooping ears, and large dewlap and its physiology helps it tolerate heat stress. Archaeologists believe that the Zebu cattle was probably domesticated somewhere between the 6th through the 4th millennium BC. Water buffalo were probably domesticated about the same time. The water buffalo actually provides the most dairy products and milk on the subcontinent today. But let's talk about how we might see domestication in the archaeological record. When we talk about animal domestication, we're talking not just about humans controlling animals, but also controlling their reproduction. This is what often creates the changes that we can identify archeologically to tell the difference between wild and domesticated animals. That's right, we might see changes in size or shape. For example, the wild ancestors known as oryx were much larger and more aggressive than today's domesticated cattle. At sites like Mehergar and Teshwar, we can see progressively smaller cattle at the beginning of the 8th millennium. However, even once cattle and buffalo were domesticated, their wild relatives continue to be important. Several scholars have speculated that the Bronze Age economy of the Indus civilization was based on cattle pastoralism. Archaeologically, we can see as much as three-fourths of all faunal assemblages of the Indus sites are made up of cattle. At Indus sites in Gujarat, strontium isotope analysis has indicated that cattle were not raised locally as in comparison to goats. The site of Dolavira has large water tanks, which some have speculated were used for helping to raise water buffalo. We also begin to find increased evidence for secondary product use. When societies begin to value animals for the labor, dairy, and wool they provide, archaeologists call this the secondary products revolution. Part of the significance of the secondary products revolution is that cattle come to be seen as forms of wealth and status, not just subsistence. The herd profiles of Indus and other contemporaneous sites in the region suggest that cattle were being kept to old age. This would indicate the use of secondary products. Evidence of osteoarthritis and lower limb joints of cattle in Baluchistan and other Indus regions suggest that they were used for traction. There's been a lot of speculation about how much dairy was consumed in the Indus diet. Ceramic vessels have been analyzed by their form as well as by analyzing the residues left behind when they were used as cooking vessels. It has been speculated that many of the perforated jars that are found at archaeological sites were used for making curd or yogurt. At Harappa, various hearths were thought to have served the purpose of dudkarnas for preparing the curd. Residue analysis has shown that some vessels were used to boil both dairy and meat. In many ways, we can think of the important function that cattle have played throughout time in South Asia, but we can also extend our understanding to more symbolic forms of meaning. Correct. And in many ways, the functional value and the symbolic value of cattle are interrelated. Culturally, we can see the importance of cattle in their art and material culture. Thousands of cattle and bull figurines have been found at sites dating from the Neolithic period onwards. These figurines may have been toys or they may have served ritual purposes. Indus seals found in Mesopotamia often contain the humblest bison which may be a possible wild gar. Zebu bowls are found in some of the most finely carved examples of Indus seals. However, they're still outnumbered by unicorns. Eh? Yes, unicorns. But because the zebu bowls are relatively rare, some people have suggested that they were associated with a ruling class. The ritual and cultural importance of water buffalo to Indus peoples are shown in many of their narrative scenes and iconographies. Looking to the south, the importance of cattle in antiquity is also well demonstrated through rock art, figurines, and unique monumental forms. In Bilari and Raichur districts of Karnataka, Archaeologists have documented an extraordinary phenomenon known as Neolithic ash mounds associated with the earliest farming communities of the southern Deccan between the 2nd and 3rd millennium BC. These ash mounds are monumental accumulations of cow dung that have been burned at such high temperatures that they've become vitrified or turned to stone. Don't you have an ash mound where you work, Nala? 
Yes, we do. There's an ash mound at the base of the hill known as Jakaragunda. It isn't as large as some of the other ash mounds that we find in the region, but our team has taken radiocarbon dates that place its construction to the mid-2nd millennium BC. In addition to this ash mound, our team has documented scores of rock art images across the landscape, which again shows the tremendous importance of cattle to the local economy since very early times. Very cool. We can continue to track the importance of cattle and water buffalo in South Asian societies from the earliest times through the modern day. At other sites in Central and South India, rock art depictions go from wild bovids during the Paleolithic era to domesticated plow and chariot pulling zebu cattle during the historic period. There's abundance of cattle imagery from ancient India. Although we are still untangling the earliest archeological evidence for domestication, it is clear that these animals had great importance from the earliest of antiquity. Yes, and the many dairy-based foods and drinks found in South Asia, like chai, are a true testament to that. Okay, so we covered the spices and now we've covered the milk. What's next on our list, Nama? Let's first take a look at the sugar that's often added to chai and think a little bit about how this sweetener became popular around the world. And I'm afraid this is when colonialism is finally going to have to enter the picture. I know, but sugar has a long and industry and history that we should cover as well. Join us next time for another episode of Chai Stories, and be sure to check out other original videos from Archaeology Now.